Jackson from Scale Theatre. I work for the York Archaeological Trust, um, and we are going to be looking at uh, your dig, uh, which is our um, new community engagement program at York Archaeological Trust. Like I said. So, um, for those of you who don't know us, the York Archaeological Trust is um, a interesting and complex organisation. We have five uh, accredited museums in York, the most famous of which is Yorvik, the Viking Centre, uh, and then also Dick, an Archaeological Adventure, Marley Hall, Richard III and Henry VII. Uh, we also have contracting archaeological fieldwork units based in York, Sheffield, Nottingham and Glasgow. So um, we're uh, uh, quite a unique organisation in that we cover quite a large spectrum of archaeology and have lots of different ways um, that people uh, interact with, or we interact with people uh, across through our work at the Trust. So uh, my role at the Trust is uh, a community engagement manager. I came to the Trust and joined uh, in 2016. And the post I took then was a new role. I took over uh, from what was a head of audience development. Um, but when, when that particular person left, they, the trust decided to rejig that role and to, to frame it slightly differently. The idea being that I would be based as an archaeologist within the museum's division, but that I would have a remit to work across the trust. So within the museum's division, but across into the archaeological fieldwork units. The idea of which being that um, we would be aiming to bring some museum practice, some of that uh, audience development work into the field, into the archaeological uh, setting, particularly in a commercial setting is the ambition in the long term. So when I arrived two years ago, um, I uh, arrived in an organisation which had two already very established ways of engaging with the public. We uh, have a very uh, successful and um, we like to think world leading approach to uh, engagement with the public and visitor experiences within our attractions. Um, we have, uh, as I say, Yorvik, which is a very well-known piece of heritage interpretation and is trendsetting in, in many ways. Um, but we also have an offer of DIG, an archaeological adventure, which is an archaeological museum designed for children uh, from the ages of 5 to 12. And the idea being that it's an immersive experience for children to come, learn to be archaeologists, have an introduction in the site hut, go through the dig pits, go through discovery, uh, of, um, of sites in the dig pits and then finish with a, um, uh, a, a finds handling and um, sorting activity. So this, although a very immersive and interactive experience, is, is fairly passive. The visitor um, has a, an interaction that we have designed and we guide them through. So that's one model of interaction. We then, in the other side of the trust, in our community uh, outreach of our field worker teams, have a, um, a particular model of engagement on site, the, the traditional community archaeology model, whether it be training excavations that we are um, receiving payment for training for those who want to learn to be archaeologists, or community uh, work working with particular groups. We bring people onto site and teach them to be archaeologists. We teach them to dig to gather and take part in the archaeological process. Um, the ambition when I started this role was to consider these two different models of engagement with the public and to see if there was another way, if there was a, diff a, a level in between this passive presentation of archaeology and the full-on digging and data gathering of new evidence. Do we always need to be data gathering when we're involving the public in archaeology? Is there no way for um, people to take part in understanding the meaning of what archaeology is and to take part in the heritage interpretation process? As a separate note, I, um, I would suggest that um, for, for it's been a very interesting challenge for me coming into this. When I started this role, I had been a professional archaeologist for 14 years and I thought I was fairly well experienced in talking to the public about archaeology. Um, it hit me rather hard when I came into a museum setting then to realise that actually heritage interpretation is a whole other specialism and another field. 
that there was a lot to learn. And I think that, um, as I've said before in other settings, is a lesson that I think a lot of archaeologists could really do learn. Uh, and that heritage interpretation is a separate skill that we need to learn and we need, and need to engage with. <coughs> So this is the challenge. Um, so when um, I was presented the challenge, we decided to, um, well, I decided, I guess, uh, um, uh, to come up with a way of forming a programme um, to try and tackle this. So I, I designed a series of, of projects that um, came with these particular ambitions that we wanted to, to change this model of engagement and that we wanted um, to, to try and enact in the work that we did. So these are sort of the principles in which this work was founded, I guess. The most important of which being that experts don't have all the answers. I very firmly believe that we as archaeologists are experts in the data gathering. We have a code, a technique, a way of investigating the parts. That doesn't mean that we necessarily know what that evidence means or even that we have the exclusive right of interpreting that evidence, and we may not always get it right. Or that other people who do not use this badge, archaeologists, have just as, as much a right to interpret this evidence in their own way. We are merely there to facilitate them to understand the code that we use to uncover this archaeology, to encourage this knowledge. So we need to create a, a programme in which people felt free and able to examine evidence in their own way and to come to their own conclusions. To explore that archaeological evidence being most important, we didn't want to tell people stories, we didn't want to feed people information. The idea was to present our evidence and to allow them to find their own way through that evidence. We wanted to create a space in which people could have their own individual responses to find meaning. Meaning is an individual situated emotion. It is something that you experience yourself. If you are not given the tools, or do not have the tools, or not have the opportunity to consider evidence and come to meaning yourself, how can you truly understand it? We felt very strongly that this needed to be a collaborative process, and that we in no way could do this on our own. I, it seems to me, particularly when I'm in, in museum settings, that people, particularly audience development uh, staff, can often feel very much that they need to be developing audiences in and of themselves. They are responsible creating audiences. Audiences are out there. There are, is a whole ecosystem of community settings in which people already are involved and working. What we need to do is to tap into that society, into that um, ecosystem of people who are already engaged and work out how to talk to them, rather than necessarily drumming up audiences for ourselves. And the other important premise was that this would be uh, a program that would be able to use imagination and creativity to bring archaeology alive. So they were the ambitions that I started with. Um, so over the last two and a half years, we have been running uh, pilot projects. Um, and the reason, I guess, that this is so uh, unique, I think, um, these projects within this sector is that although we had some um, Smart County funding to build a community exhibition space within our museum um, to create a space that these, this work could be displayed and exhibited to the public. Um, the funding for the work in and of itself, my time, is core funded through the York Archaeological Trust. It's not grant funded by not having to write project designs uh, which already pre, um, predetermine outcomes in order to get funding. I can let projects develop and grow, let the participants grow the project and see where it goes without having to justify to a funder why I've done that, which I think is a really important part of this work. So we created this, um, this gallery that opened uh, in January 2018, which really feels like a very long time ago. Um, and we have, uh, as I say, been uh, running a program of projects Projects tend to last between four to six months, working particularly with partners and community groups um, within uh, Yorkshire at the moment. Um, and they culminate in the creation of an exhibition. So this, the ambition of this project is that this is a long-term fixture within the York Archaeological Trust work, and that this will eventually, once uh, 
these, now that these pilots have been uh, shown to be a success, that the ambition is this to embed the work across the trust. So this is not a short-term, three to five year HMF from this project. This is something that we are trying to embed within the core of our work from a day-to-day uh, perspective. So I'm going to, as I say, we've done, um, we've done four exhibitions now, and we're working on the fifth, um, but I'm going to focus on one project in particular to show an example in depth of the type of work that we've been doing. Um, but we, I'm happy to tell you about any of the other projects at a, uh, a coffee or any time after that if you want to hear about them. So this one particular one, Your Dig Converge. We worked with uh, Converge, which is an award-winning program led by University um, York St John University uh, in partnership with uh, statutory mental health services in New York. The idea being that uh, people who have experienced mental ill health can access very high quality arts education for free uh, in, in, in order to help recovery. Uh, the ambition is to, to, for people to take part in uh, these activities to regain confidence and to explore the world in a safe environment. So we worked in particular with Converge with one particular group called Discover Museums uh, who were um, a particular stream uh, based on participants from the, who access facilities to mind within York. Uh, the mental health of charity. The idea of this course was that it was a route back into uh, cultural life. If, if, if um, you have been experiencing mental health challenges, uh, re-entering spaces like museums can feel like a very big challenge. So the idea of this course was um, to, to guide uh, people through that process and to, to give confidence and to, uh, experience of, exper uh, to give experience of the rich museum uh, settings within York. So um, we worked with this particular um, group and we took as our, um, our uh, inspiration after talking to the group uh, a particular site called Union Terrace, which you can see York St John, you can see it in this uh, photograph here, this is the building that the, the, the course took part in. This is a, a, car, a coach park just outside that was excavated in 1972 by the York Archaeological Trust. It's a normal York ex Excavation, uh, so it has one of everything. It had Roman, Viking, uh, uh, medieval priory, um, the school where Guy Fawkes went to school, obviously, uh, Civil War, um, a plague pit, anything you can think of basically was on this site. Um, so it had been written up, it's this very boring, I have to say, uh, grade it report. Uh, all the archive had been neatly filed in our store, and that was the end of it. It had never been interpreted in any way or displayed to the public. So we uh, decided that that needed to change, and that actually this uh, archive was, was a prime example of, of, of how we could um, look at this archaeology in more depth. So we started working with the group, and we did a lot of series of sense of place workshops, uh, looking around the space, uh, taking lots of practice from mindfulness practice about really examining and paying attention to our environment. Uh, and began to look at this area and uh, <coughs> the participants began to see clues to the, to the past and uh, looking in detail at, at textures, colours um, of their surroundings and taking, taking notice of their surroundings in this particular place. We then did a finds handling workshop um, which uh, focused on the, on the materials from this particular um, from this particular excavation. And these, uh, the group broke these uh, objects in, down into these particular um, categories. So the ambition of this project was that we would not, we, I uh, me, your archaeological trust, would not be curating this exhibition. These particular participants would be leading and interpreting this material with my support, but without my guidance if that makes sense of exactly what this is. So all of the writing, these are, are screenshots of the panels that are in the exhibition, all the text you see in the exhibition is their writing, it's their voice, it's not mine, it's not Yats, it's their interpretation, which was a very important uh, principle of this exhibition. Um, we uh, focus very much in the exhibition about their story. They felt very keenly that this was an exhibition about them. It was an exhibition about their interpretation and their experiences rather than necessarily about the past. 
which I thought was a really interesting uh, differenti differentiation. Um, fascinatingly, we, we, when they were writing about this, they created their own timelines and picked out what was important to them. You can't read these very well, and I can, I can share the slides back if you want, but what's really interesting was the debate I had with my curation team, um, who really struggled with the sense of certainty that is written on these panels. There are facts laid out here. There's no ambiguity. This is how people have seen the evidence and have interpreted it. We, as, as professional curators, would probably not use such definite language. I had a real battle because um, I wanted, on what well, I wanted, I say, we wanted um, the finds labels to be written, and the finds labels were written by the participants, but my finds team, my curation team, were very worried that there wasn't actual identifications. What are these objects? Um, and they were really uncomfortable with not having that um, precision of, of detail written on the slide. And we had a real battle about this, about what was the right thing to do. In the end, I had to give in, and we had little handheld uh, finds labels that were kind of tucked around the corner. So if anyone was really um, was, uh, desperate to know what these objects were, they could find out. I did keep an eye, and I never did see anyone looking at them, um, which you could take for whatever you like. Um, but yes, yeah, so that was a really interesting uh, part of this process for us, of learning to co-curate, was about letting go a little bit, and about actually does it really matter that our expert voice is not there um, in this exhibition? I don't know, uh, but I think it was very important to the participants that their voice was there. To me, that is a counterbalance for that in no particular way. So, um, we also did art workshops, and um, so all the, the artwork that the participants uh, did and interpreted the objects in this way. So we then uh, took all this work, we took the interpretation to uh, other courses that were happening within Converge. We went to a songwriting workshop and a creative writing workshop where all the participants had their own creative responses to the interpretation that this one particular group had done of this evidence. So I have some, hopefully, of my technical skills work, uh, one of the songs from, um, from the exhibition which I was going to play you an excerpt of. Hopefully. Digging through time, we can only guess what your life was like. Hidden deep inside, the past holds secrets you keep. Everything you touch was made by someone you knew. Finding fragments of your life with fear. Can I see you through the black smoke? Your Roman clay lamp burning. Can I see you through the dark nights? Your prayer book filled with yearning. And through this mess of time, we So then uh, we also went to a creative writing workshop was fascinating, the imagination that came out uh, for interpreting these objects, the things that people thought of, I would never have gone anywhere. And this one, uh, I just sort of play you my, one of my favourites, uh, which is an advert for quernstones, because we had a Viking quernstone. Don't you hate it when your flower tastes limestoney? Or when your limestone breaks while crushing corn? And then you have to go and find another limestone or other stone that just doesn't do the job. We have the answer. Presenting from JML, Quernstone, mined from majestic Scandinavian volcanoes. Need to crush corn? Easy. Grinding wheat? A delightful treat. Powdered rye? Give it a try. Quernstone, for all your pulverising needs. Here comes the science. Quernstone has little air pockets uniquely fashioned from thousands of years of volcanic eruptions. So when you want to smash something into smithereens, just remember, Quernstone, from JML. <laughs> Brilliant. And that's, um, that was the guy who wrote it, uh, was voicing it, and uh, that was uh, very important for the participants that their voice was in the exhibition. Uh, we also did the work, theatre workshop, and again, the, um, the imagination of what came out was fascinating. I'm just going to play you a bit of a clip of... Um... Good evening. 
Friends, Romans, and citizens, this is the news from Eber Arkham. The year is 211 AD. It's just been reported that the Emperor Severus has died. There will be a, a lamp procession through York to the hill of Severus, where he will be cremated and his ashes will be sent back to Rome by oil lamp light. Groundbreaking news now just come in. A giant jellyfish ate my family. A giant jellyfish leapt from the murky waters of the River Ouse and gobbled up a woman and her two children, claims the man accused of their murder. <laughs> Warehouse worker Romanus, 38, saves a juddering monster from the deep swallowed his wife and kids whole in a terrifying attack. The centurion guards have arrested Romanus, but he's sticking to his fishy story about the quivering beast the size of a chariot. They were surrounded by cloudy, white, jelly-like material. They were trying desperately to pull themselves out, but the monster kept sucking them in. And now over to the weather. One more story, one more song. So that, um, I, well, to me, was fascinating. That that's that's what the interpretation was. That's how they interpreted. Um, uh, so yeah, the imagination that came out was it went in completely different directions that I had never possibly thought were ever going to go. Um, so the exhibition that we we this was the uh, pictures of the final exhibition that we put together. Uh, and we um, had a big celebration party uh, to celebrate. It was also a, a coincidence with the 10th year of, of Converse. So we had a big birthday party for them as well, um, with many smiling, happy faces. And the emotion of people when they came and saw the exhibition, there were people in tears. They were so excited to see it. And I was in tears. It was awful. They all the big mess. Um, but <laughs> we, um, the connections that people made were astounding, and the difference, the feedback that we got and the difference to people's confidence uh, from the beginning to the end of the project was astounding. So what's next so I, I, um, for this programme? I think we, I like to think in the five, pro, um, the five uh, projects that we have run so far that we have um, met our aims and that we continue to do so and we continue to build on this and to continue this programme of running these projects. Um, we are developing this model, what I'm trying to, I'm beginning to term, trying to coin the phrase of participatory interpretation. In fact, that the, the interpretation of the archaeological evidence of the record is something that you and everybody can take part in. This is an active and creative process. Um, I, this is what I think I'm trying to define. I, every time I do this talk, or, or define it, I'm defining it slightly differently and kind of honing it. But I think what I'm trying to say is that the interpretation of archaeological evidence as an active, creative process to take part in. This is fun and something that we can all do and should be doing. It's something that allows us to work as a group, to, to generate individual creativity, individual understanding and to find that meaning. It creates a meaningful connection to evidence and objects. Um, it creates individual interpretation of that evidence and creates an, an, an atmosphere in which you can get active engagement with in which you're trying to present uh, is the theory. So I've continued this practice and we, I've been working with all sorts of different creative practitioners and doing a lot of CPD on my own, uh, of working with creative practitioners and learn to, to um, uh, lead creative, facilitate creative practice, if you see what I mean, how to engender that within people and to get people to have confidence to do it. So I've been working in particular with York Dance Space and a very uh, amazing choreographer never sorry, choreographer. Um, and we've been doing these workshops about exploring objects through movement and dance and using artifact biographies and exploring the life cycle of objects through dance. And you're lucky you haven't got more time as you'd all be up doing a dance workshop right now. We'll do that maybe another time. Um, but it works. The, it, I've had people dancing the smell of tin objects, which is like, who knew that you could do that? But you can. Um, and it's working. Uh, and I've gone on to um, use these techniques uh, in other settings, again, working with people with mental health challenges. Um, and I have, in the space of 20 minutes, 
got people describing and talking about objects in a way that would be recognisable as a small find specialist to describe objects. Using creative practice to build confidence works. Um, so it's something that uh, I'm, I'm trying to develop in and of myself, and the ambition is that we, uh, I am then disseminating this, this work and this learning through my team and, our, um, and through the, the other staff within the trust. And let's say the idea is the ambition is to embed this work. So the next project, um, these chaps are uh, from uh, Help for Heroes charity, the Phoenix House Recovery Centre up at Catterick. They're one of the biggest garrisons uh, in Europe. Um, and it's a, a centre for, for injured service personnel. And we are creating a project at the moment. These guys came to me in January and said, we're building a Viking ship, do you want to be involved? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, so every time I talk to them, it gets bigger. We're now a 25 foot ship, an actual ship they're going to sail. Um, and we are doing a, a project with the whole centre. The ambition is we're going to get the whole centre involved and we're doing work with their creative writing and arts programmes. And the ambition is that we're creating a, another, pro another exhibition that will go in and we're going to launch the ship, literally launch it in the river. The ambition is next February at the Viking Festival. Um, so we, um, yeah, we're continuing to develop this, this model and hopefully uh, it will continue to, to be successful in that way. And I think that's it.